Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, everyone to the Nephrology Grand Rounds uh, of 2022. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Um, we are uh, now having external speakers at the Nephrology Grand Rounds in Ottawa, and I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Joshua King. Uh, Dr. King is, uh, received his med training from Penn State and then uh, did medical residency at um, um, University of Virginia and went on to do nephrology fellowship at Johns Hopkins. But he didn't stop there. He went on to do a medical toxicology fellowship. And I'm told he is one of the few or if the only one who has a nephrology as well as a toxicology fellowship uh, in, in the US, if not worldwide. Uh, he is a clinician educator. So he's a program director uh, right now at the University of Maryland Medical School. But he's also the medical director of the Maryland Poison Center. Uh, and as an educator, I know him mostly via Twitter where he tweets at Nephro Talks and he's always available as a resource when people have esoteric questions about poisons and toxins. Um, so today he'll be talking to us about um, uh, extracorporeal treatment in the setting of uh, metabolic acidosis uh, and some thoughts uh, around that. Uh, welcome, Dr. King. Uh, and sorry, as a, as a, a reminder, we will be recording this um, uh, presentation. Uh, and the video will be available later on our YouTube channel as well. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Hiramath. It's a very kind uh, introduction. And um, you know, there there is another nephrologist, uh, toxicologist in Australia, Darren Roberts, who is much uh, smarter and uh, uh, you know more handsome than I am. But uh, you, you you've got me, so I'm I'm happy to, uh, uh, to to try to talk with you for a little bit. And and thank you all very much for inviting me. Um, so what I'd love to talk about today is um, some some thoughts, some things that I wish I knew earlier in practice, uh, and some uh, uh, some elements of practice which are tied to both the you know, nephrology, typically acute care, as well as medical toxicology. Um, there are a few areas where nephrology and toxicology overlap, as you know very well primarily dialysis of toxins, although not exclusively. And, and these are the areas that, that I love to, uh, to, to kind of focus my, my work in. And uh, the, the first dis, uh, disclaimer I want to make is that this is toxicology. In toxicology, we don't have randomized controlled trials with thousands or tens of thousands of patients. We have the case series of eight patients from 1974. Um, so please bear in mind that the quality of evidence is not very high. I will do my best to point out where I am showing opinion, which is plenty of it, versus uh, when I am actually referencing uh, good data. But just assume that the data aren't great. Um, I have no financial disclosures. And let's start off by hearing from uh, Philippus Aurelius Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim, so also known as Paracelsus. Uh, he is known as one of the godfathers of, of uh, toxicology. Um, he was a physician, although he was probably more of an alchemist than he was a physician. Uh, he was a clinician educator for one year, after which he burned all of his students' uh, books in a bonfire and said that he had more knowledge than all of the ancient Greek physicians in his little finger. And he might have also died in a bar fight. So why do we still remember this guy? Well, in talks, we still remember this guy because he said, sola dosis facet venenum. What is that that is not poison? All things are poison and nothing with is, is without poison. Only the dose determines that a thing is not a poison. Um, and we live by this adage, really the dose makes the poison. Uh, we start off our toxicology education rounds each day by asking people to name some exposure they had, food, hobby, what have you, and, and point out the, the, the poison inherent in it. But if you're going to go with this concept, well, if the dose makes the poison, well, what if you can remove the dose? And, and we as nephrologists have the somewhat unique ability to remove the dose via dialysis. And this is not a new thing. If you go back to the first uh, experiments where uh, hemodialysis was first being developed across town here in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins, uh, salicylate uh, was used as one of the earliest um, uh, experimental measures of how well dialysis works. Um, let's start off by going through some thoughts about extracorporeal removal of toxins, and then we'll move into some specific examples. Um, and the same principles that underlie removal of uremic toxins underlie removal of 
extra, you know, xenobiotic poisons uh, and uh, you know, drugs and toxins. So the first rule and the most important is that we cannot remove any toxins that are not in the blood, as you know. In other words, the volume of distribution of a toxin needs to be low enough that dialysis can enact a meaningful removal. Uh, and just a quick uh, reminder of what this concept is, the volume of distribution is if you give a dose to a patient, you, you can come up with this theoretical volume um, that would describe how it was um, uh, distributed in the body where drugs with higher concentrations distribute preferentially to plasma. These are things we can dialyze like caffeine, drugs with higher volumes distribution, hydroxychloroquine, calcium channel blockers, uh, et cetera, are drugs that primarily hang out in tissue and fat, and these are not drugs that we can remove. And this is not a linear concept, meaning that a, a, a drug with a volume of distribution of two doesn't have twice as much uh, a drug in the fat as it does in the, in the plasma, it's, it's, uh, it's exponential. Um, and there is a slight change of volume of distribution and overdose, but not enough really to make a big difference. So if you take the concept of, well, hemodialysis does a good job of removing some uremic toxins, um, such as phosphate or asymmetric dimethylarginine, but it doesn't do a great job of removing, say, indole derivatives. Well, you know what? Same for dialysis for toxins. We can remove our water-soluble toxins, such as aspirin and ethylene glycol, and perhaps certain water-soluble beta blockers like atenolol, but then you go on to more lipophilic drugs like TCAs and most calcium channel blockers and such, and we can't meaningfully remove them. This is the underlying principle that plays the biggest factor in whether a drug is dialyzable. The next is whether it's small enough to pass the dialyzer membrane. This almost never plays a big role. The vast majority of drugs are small enough to cross the dialyzer membrane. However, larger compounds do move more slowly uh, across a, a membrane. And you can you know, see this concept by just taking a, a manufacturer spec sheet. So uh, for example, uh, looking at a, an example hemodialysis spec sheet here, you see that, well, at a given blood flow rate and dialysate flow rate, we can enact pretty good clearance of urea but maybe half, uh, we can only remove half as much B12, simply because it's, you know, primarily because it's a larger compound. Um, and you can even go to high cutoff dialyzers and say, well, we can still remove some things, uh, you know, such as myoglobin um, you know, at, uh, at reasonable uh, you know, uh, levels. This just doesn't usually play a role because the vast majority of drugs are lower than, say, a thousand Daltons, and the few standouts like vancomycin you know, still are reasonably dialyzable. Um, you know, uh, conversely, you can't remove things like monoclonal antibodies that you would need to consider if you had to remove them extracorporeally. You know, uh, uh, plasma phoresis or exchange transfusion. The last um, you know, principle for, uh, well, maybe not the last. There's one more principle of uh, removal of, dialysis, of uh, drugs on dialysis is that the drug must not be bound to plasma proteins, which themselves are too large to cross the dialyzer membrane. Um, and what you can do is take these data, which examine the removal of uremic toxins and illustrate how this is not the most limiting factor. Um, let's take a uremic toxin, which is hardly protein bound at all, 13% protein bound. You do a nice four hour run of dialysis, you remove about 75%. Great take something that is five times as protein bound. You remove still more than 50% during a four hour run of hemodialysis. And even drugs that are 95% protein bound, you can remove a third of them during a four hour run. Why is this? Because there's an equilibration between bound and unbound drug. And as you remove free drug, um, you have um, you know, the bound drug come off albumin. What's the problem here? The problem is that the same underlying physical property that makes these drugs likely to be protein bound is their lipophilicity. And highly protein bound drugs almost always have a high volume of distribution. If you have the rare drug, which is highly protein bound, but also water soluble, and generally you can dialyze that. We use an arbitrary 80% protein bound cutoff, but I, I want you to point out how arbitrary that is. The last principle, one that isn't talked about quite as much, is that when you're dialyzing a patient, you know, when we're removing potassium from a patient, we don't really care about removing it from the blood, right? That's what we measure. We care about removing it, say, from within the heart. You care about your removing 
drugs from their organ of toxicity. I want to remove lithium and salicylate from the brain. Um, and that's great for most drugs, but there are a few drugs, primarily lithium, although there's a few others like dabigatran and vancomycin that take their sweet time moving from tissue to plasma. And, and what does this mean? Well, let's look at lithium as an example, and we'll look at lithium um, you know, back in 1969 when um, there was a case report published of a patient who came in with a lithium level of nearly three and lithium toxicity and was dialyzed on a twin coil dialyzer, got that level down to below one. Fantastic. However, hours later, that serum lithium level creeped back up. However, because this was 1969 in IRB Schmeyerby, the patient also had an indwelling uh, CSF catheter and CSF lithium levels show that the levels in the tissue continue to go down over time. This is what we care about. But because lithium has to move from cells to blood via sodium channels, it takes longer to remove the lithium from the cell than it does to remove it from the blood. The vast majority of drugs, it takes longer to remove from the blood than from the cell. In other words, the transition across the cell is nearly instantaneous. Um, but for those drugs where the reverse is true, you get a rebound phenomenon where serum levels will go up. This is not necessarily a bad thing, but it does limit the amount you can remove during a single run of therapy. So um, something to, to, to think about. Um, and uh, you know, if you look further at lithium, and this is a paper that uh, examined um, modeling of intracellular levels versus serum lithium levels, you see, well, what if I'm dialyzing a patient who has lithium toxicity? How do I most optimally remove that lithium? Um, well, if the patient's kidneys work at 24 hours, hemodialysis and CRT aren't too far off in terms of tissue lithium level removed. So you get pretty good tr uh, treatment if you if you were to have the luxury of performing hemodialysis followed by CRT, you'd remove more. By the way, this is probably the only compound which I will personally regularly recommend CRT for, and we'll go into why later. Um, if you have impaired kidney function, um, well, now you have more, uh, you've gotten rid of your endogenous lithium removal, and you have to consider either continuous removal or performing dialysis more than once in a 24 hour period in order to enact good amounts of lithium removal, where continuous modalities actually edge out hemodialysis in this regard. And once again, the fast initial removal coupled by slow ongoing removal of CRT still wins the day. Does this matter clinically? We don't know because it's tox and data are terrible. However, um, if, if you're looking to see, if you, if you are concerned that a patient has very severe toxicity, such as seizures or severe encephalopathy, or is a very high risk of say late presenting toxicity, which is what we generally care about lithium. I, I don't care so much, but very few patients are gonna die from acute lithium toxicity. You worry more like carbon monoxide that they'll have permanent neuro damage down the line. And, and that's much of what drives dialysis and lithium. But you can see how this rebound affects what would otherwise be a fairly you know, effective removal of this drug. So which drugs are dialyzable? Well, the big three, and if you're a renal fellow, um, or if you're someone like me this year who's gonna re-up their renal boards, you need to know the big three, toxic alcohols, lithium, and salicylates. These encompass 75% of hemodialysis for poisoning in the developing world. Um, these are the ones to know. Then there's a whole host of drugs that you can dialyze. Um, and if you want to review um, you know, the vast majority of them, you can go to the XTRIP website, which we'll, I'll cite later on in this, this talk, and you can look up their, their uh, practice guidelines to suggest how to do this. Um, but you know what? New drugs come out all the time. So knowing those principles of, hey, this drug is new, it's in a phase two trial and our patient took an overdose of it, or it's, we think it's built up, can we remove it? You know, that, you know, it's uh, knowing what we're doing and how we remove drugs is important to help figure that out. Um, well, let's look at some epidemiology. If you are looking at which drugs are removed, this is um, averaged over a, a five-year period, I believe uh, in the early 2000s, where um, in, in the, you know, North America, we're primarily talking about toxic alcohol. So once again, ethylene glycol and methanol, lithium and salicylates. This is 75% roughly. Um, everything else kind of uh, you know, fills in the gaps, and you should also bear in mind these data 
are not collected with the idea of the intent to dialyze. So you'll also see things like acetaminophen, where we will occasionally dialyze for acetaminophen toxicity, but this is far more likely to be someone who has, say, acute liver failure and acute kidney injury due to acetaminophen poisoning and is on CRRT, as these data also did not, at least at this time, differentiate between um, uh, the you know, hemo and CRRT, as these were poison center data, they do now. And you can see that the use of extracorporeal therapies has gone up over the past few decades. So, um, you know, roughly, in, in North America, there are uh, about 7,000 uh, know, therapies performed every five years. So as an individual nephrologist, you might not see a lot of this. Um, you know, I completed a, a busy two-year renal fellowship uh, at a 1,200-bed hospital, and I dialyzed zero patients for poisoning. However, um, as a discipline, we do this periodically. So, um, and, and I see a hand is up. I am happy to stop for a, a question if, if, uh, if desired. It was an old hand, I think. Okay, no worries. Um, well, we'll move on. I, I'm gonna have some time at the end for questions. Um, so uh, let's move on to talk about toxic alcohols. These are one of the most uh, you know, iconic poisons that we remove with, with uh, extracorporeal therapies and iconic for the nephrologist because you've got your anion gap acidosis. So you've got diagnosis of acidosis, uh, of the, the, the etiology of acidosis. You've got, you know, dialytic removal. It's great, um, you know, except of course for, for the person who is actually poisoned by it. Please do not misconstrue me. Um, so th there are more toxic alcohols than methanol and ethylene glycol. But these are the big two that, that we learn about, and I'll talk about them. I just want to point out that all of these alcohols, uh, these short chain alcohols are first metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase, uh, which is usually the rate limiting step, then by aldehyde dehydrogenase. And for those alcohols like ethylene glycol and diethylene glycol that have more than one hydroxy group, also by LDH, and they are metabolized um, you know, to uh, carboxylic acids that both produce acidemia as well as um, a, a, a toxic effect due to uh, anions. And um, uh, briefly, I, I will point out that every once in a while you'll see propylene glycol toxicity from either ingestion of uh, you know, uh, safer antifreezes, uh, safer than ethylene glycol, or you'll see toxicity from, say, lorazepam, which is 80% uh, you know, propylene glycol by weight in the IV form, given to, say, someone who has end-stage kidney disease for alcohol withdrawal. Uh, if they're put on a drip for a couple of days, you might see an anion gap acidosis due to D-lactate as well as L-lactate. Um, periodically, there are diethylene glycol poisonings. Uh, this is found in brake fluid, but this is also notorious for mass poisonings throughout the world. And the, the first of these occurred in 1937 in the US, around 100 people died when this was used as the syrup for a medication instead of glycerol. And the next year that the US FDA got teeth to uh, be able to regulate excipients as well as the drugs themselves. And that story has played out time after time again. I believe the most recent mass poisoning was in Panama and it was pretty awful. Um, it, uh, in addition to, uh, to uh, anti-gap acidosis, diethylene glycol causes neurotoxicity uh, and uh, acute kidney injury. And lastly, why doesn't uh, isopropyl alcohol is metabolized, but it's not metabolized to a carboxylic acid. It's metabolized to a terminal ketone, acetone. So it will not give you an anti-gap acidosis, although it will make you drunk as a skunk because it's twice as inebriating as ethanol. Um, and you don't want to block it with fomepazole unless you want your patient to remain drunk for a long period of time. We uh, typically don't have access to real-time toxic alcohol lab measurements. What we have access to is the osmol gap. And the osmol gap is this concept where if these, these substances are osmotically active, remember physical chemistry? Sure you do. And, and undoubtedly you loved uh, the freezing point depression where um, you know, mixture of a substance like ethylene glycol or methanol will depress the freezing point. Well, this is what is done in the, in the lab to measure a serum osmolality. Uh, if you calculate a serum osmolality and there's a big difference between the two, you have what's termed an osmol gap. Um, and at the point of uh, ingestion of a toxic alcohol, if a patient presented uh, immediately afterward, they would have a high osmol gap 
and a normal anion gap. As that uh, toxin is metabolized to its constituent carboxylic acid, the osmol gap drops and the anion gap rises. Um, your patient can present anywhere along this line. If you're lucky and they drank ethanol, as, as many do, um, they'll present here uh, before anything can happen as ethanol is preferentially metabolized. Um, talking about methanol, this is found in windshield washing fluids, solvents, paints. Uh, it's a toxin wh which, uh, where overdoses are stratified by temperature. So methanol poisoning is more common in, in many parts of Canada than the US because people use more windshield washing fluid when you have more ice on the roads. I lived in Virginia for many years. Um, if it snows, we had back hose that, that uh, cleared the road and salt, what's that? So you just see trucks spun out on the highway like it was a post-apocalyptic nightmare. Um, and, uh, you know, however, in, in uh, you know, areas where there's lots of salt, there's lots of methanol use, so you see more overdoses. You know where you don't see it? You don't see it in illicit alcohol or moonshine in the U.S. And, and that is because uh, the penalties for alcohol are relatively light here and it's cheap and easy to get. So there's not that, it actually costs more to make your own. But if you're in a country where it costs less to make your own alcohol and you don't have access to the technology to remove methanol, then you might see a mass methanol poisoning. And there's generally a few per year, almost exclusively in developing countries. Um, it doesn't take much methanol to kill you. Um, and the way it kills you, although the blindness is the characteristic uh, effect, the, the way it typically causes death is via uh, mitochondrial toxicity in the CNS, causing things like this, where um, I, I hate to say, unfortunately, we had a patient uh, a, a little more than a month ago who had an almost identical presentation here where she presented with uh, putamen hemorrhage and um, you know cerebral edema from that. And, and uh, what you see are, are watershed areas of the brain uh, such as the the uh, the midbrain and the putamen develop necrosis and you know bad things happen as a result. Um, ethylene glycol, which is found in antifreeze, is a more common ingestant than um, uh, methanol. And, and I'm not entirely sure whether it is, other than it's substantially more palatable. This is sweet, and occasionally dogs will actually lap this up. Where if you've ever smelled methanol, there's it smells terrible. Uh, however, ethylene glycol you know, we, we'll, will occasionally get uh, children who drink it um, and uh, you know, may have an, an exposure large enough to warrant treatment. Uh, it doesn't take as much, thankfully, to cause death. Um, and because it has multiple hydroxyl groups on it, uh, it has more complicated metabolism, where 90-something percent of it is metabolized to glycolic acid. And this is primarily what causes the anion gap but a small percent is uh, metabolized to oxalic acid, and this causes the end organ damage of calcium oxalate crystallization. This generally occurs in the kidneys, but if you look at post-mortem cases, you see it in the CSF, you see it in the heart. Um, I had a conversation last month with an ME after an ethylene glycol death we had where you, know, you, you saw these crystals in, in various body fluids. Um, and this is a patient we had um, at, at Maryland. The week I arrived here, um, uh, uh, fortuitously, this patient drank ethylene glycol, fell down the stairs, came into the University of Maryland shock trauma hospital as a trauma, had an elevated lactate because glycolate can be misread as lactate on your ABG analyzers, the ones that use lactate oxidase. And this was thought due to the fall, but then they called us when her anion gap kept rising. Um, we spun her urine and this is what we found. You know, a little blurry, please forgive me, but uh, some uh, calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals here. These are the ones that cause the pathophysiology. Not only do they choke up the renal tubules, but they lacerate them as well. And a few dihydrates as well, your, your more benign envelope shaped ones. And as you zoomed out in the urine, you saw more and more of these crystals. So how do we treat these patients? Well, fomepazole is a synthetic inhibitor of alcohol dehydrogenase. This prevents them from being metabolized from methanol and ethylene glycol to their toxic metabolites. And eth methanol and ethylene glycol themselves are not that toxic. Ethylene glycol is inebriating, but not horribly so. However, if you've already formed these metabolites, you might need to consider dialysis, and I'll show some practice guidelines. 
There are some remote hospitals that do not have fomepazole. Often they don't have fomepazole and they don't have nephrology access. These are places like critical access centers in, in um, you know, remote rural areas. And the, the way we typically advise these centers to, to deal with toxic alcohol poisoning is to go out and get vodka and administer it to the patient and transfer them to a place that has more definitive therapy. Uh, if you're looking at more evidence-based guidelines, and this extra work group um, is a group of nephrologists, toxicologists, um, and uh, pharmacists who do systematic reviews on what largely amounts to case reports. Um, uh, and uh, to, to help determine you know, where the, the best evidence base is for when you dialyze patients. XTRIP suggests either severe symptoms such as coma, seizures, or any vision deficit, severe acidemia, or a large anion gap, as well as a high methanol concentration. This one's hard to get. Realistically, you're gonna use an osmol gap as a surrogate for this unless you're very lucky, uh, or you're willing to wait a few days, in which case, hopefully the patient's been on fomepazole, uh, and hopefully they don't have a big anion gap. Um, intermittent dialysis is, is the modality of choice. I, I will try to show some connects as to why. Um, I, I joined XTRIP uh, a couple of years ago, and we have ethylene glycol, uh, uh, we have an ethylene glycol manuscript, which I understand is in the second draft, so it should be out this year. Um, and uh, with that, uh, in, before it comes out, I would suggest that you dialyze ethylene glycol poisonings for oligarch acute kidney injury, coma, seizures, shock, or um, metabolic acidosis, which is comparable to that of methanol. We have actually some better data with glycolate, and this may be based more on glycolate and how well it correlates with anion gap when the paper actually comes out. Um, what's not clear is the level that you absolutely have to remove ethylene glycol at. So ethylene glycol has a half-life of 17 hours. There are a number of patients with you know, small you know, uh, level of anion gap acidosis from ethylene glycol poisoning. Well, we can just treat them with fomepazole and wait. Maybe a level of 100, up to 100 or 200, uh, not a problem. For meth uh, methanol, its half-life is 54 hours, and it's primarily excreted by a breathing it out once you remove the, the pathway that makes the toxic alcohol. So you're much more likely to have to dialyze one of those patients unless you want to get the patient you know, really comfortable in their, their hospital bed for about a week and a half or so. Um, and uh, you, know, you dialyze till it's gone. Um, let me give a case of a, of a large ethylene glycol ingestion to, to illustrate why maybe hemodialysis is, is better than CRT. This is my bias. It's backed up by extra. It's still my bias. Um, and this was a case I saw the second month of Tox Fellowship after I was already a nephrologist, came back to fellowship. And um, this was a, a man who took a, a large tumbler, filled it with ethylene glycol, drank that, poured half a bottle of acetaminophen on it uh, as well. And he was obtunded with an exceedingly high ethylene glycol level of around 1,000. His initial osmol gap was 175. He also had ethanol on board. So he didn't develop an anion gap acidosis. So dialysis consideration was solely based on how much stuff he had, as well as the, the coma that it was ca causing. And, and the question is, how do you dialyze this patient? Well, you can take the same principles which underlie the removal of uremic toxins and apply them to um, the removal of, of uh, xenobiotics. So your, your um, same principles that you're familiar with here, your rate complex, which, you know, which we, you know, how we set dialysis, how fast we spin the blood, how fast the dialysator replacement fluid moves, um, how large our cartridge is. Um, and there's a great paper from a couple decades ago in Kidney International, which I can, I can share that, you know, shows how you can use 80% of the dialyzer urea clearance to get a really good approximation for toxic alcohols. Then, of course, how the size of the patient, it's a lot easier to remove methanol from, 100, from a 50 kilo patient than a 150 kilo patient, and how long you set the time for. So if you do this math and you, you turn it around, you can um, solve for time and say, well, if I have this level of ethylene glycol and I want it to be that level, how long approximately do I have to, to dialyze this patient? And if you do that and, and look at these factors, you find that hemodialysis is about five to 10 times as efficacious per unit time as CRT. And if you had a patient with PD access, you should probably just go ahead and, and put in a temp hemocatheter because 
PD removal of, of um, most drugs is quite poor. So if you do some math and magic and, and you solve for that time, um, you'd figure out that in this patient who was 82 kilos, it would take about 10 hours to dialyze down the ethylene glycol to where you could stop uh, you know, any therapy at all, or it would take 90 hours of CRT. And you know, have the discussion with the, the referring nephrologist. They said, you know, we can't do 10 hour treatment dialysis. It would take too long. Um, so they did a two hour chemo followed by CRT and, and I'm suggesting this as a, what not to do because this patient was in the ICU for a few days getting this stuff gone, where otherwise it could have been dialyzed and done. Now, I realize how hard it is to do a 10-hour hemo. I don't know how well I could get one myself. I think I'd get the stink eye from the dialysis charge nurse. Um, so what can you do? Well, some of it depends on what your reason is. You might need to do a 10-hour hemodialysis in a patient with profound metformin toxicity who is crashing. But someone like this, you could say, well, we'll do four hours and we'll come back later in the day. We'll do another four hour session. Um, you do have to, uh, or you could say, well, CRT isn't great, but what if I do hemo first shift and I put them on CRT in the meantime, and then I come back you know, third shift or at the end of the day and see if we can't get this patient dialyzed more quickly. You don't have to do this with most poisonings. Most aspirin, caffeine, et cetera, poisonings, your dialysis once and done. Um, but every once in a while, there's someone who needs a longer dialysis. You should be aware that if you do longer dialysis, other than once again, the, the dialysis charge nurse being very unhappy with you, um, the, uh, you, you will make patients hypophosphatemic, you will make patients alkalemic, and you should probably check intradialytic labs if you're doing it that long. Here's another case where you might need to consider aggressive dialysis. And this was a case I got involved with um, during the, the first COVID winter, uh, maybe um, you know October, September, October 2020. And this was around a, a, you know, Washington DC area hospital where a 13 year old came in uh, with a large acute metformin ingestion. They presented with a lactic acidosis and got really sick. Over the next 12 hours, they became intubated, started on epi, their lactate rose above 20, their pH was persistently below seven despite six amps of push bicarb, and they were started on CRT. So, when, well, one of, and this, once again, we're talking opinion here, but as you know, there are times when conventional hemodialysis or, you know, is superior to CRT or SLED and vice versa. Conventional hemo is so, you know, so, uh, superior for quick removal. If somebody shows up to the ED with a K of 10 and is at imminent risk of death, you probably don't put them on a slow modality. Um, if uh, somebody is in the ICU and getting better, well, it's better to have them hooked up to hemo for three or four hours and so they can work with physical therapy the rest of the day as opposed to tethered to the bed. Um, CRT or SLED, however, if you've got somebody who has a, you know, who has a midline shift or is on a presser and you're trying to remove fluid, well, this is the superior modality. Well, what about for poisoning? I, I'm gonna make a suggestion that you'd want to consider it for supportive therapy or for times where the speed of toxin removal is not emergent or for times when you have toxins with extensive rebound. Um, but when not to, and, and this is where I venture into controversy with a small amount of data to back me up. I would argue that if you have toxin-induced organ dysfunction, including shock, if removal of the toxin will fix this, then attempt to remove it as quickly as possible, despite hypotension. And for very profound shock, there's always the option of hemo through ECMO at your largest centers. So um, going back to our patient, she was on CRT, but she continued to worsen. Um, her lactate rose above the level of detection with a persistently low pH, was being considered for ECMO just due to, to general shock, and you know, discussed with the pediatric nephrologist and the, you know, said, well, would you consider hemodialysis? And the pediatric nephrologist said, you know, can I dialyze somebody on three high-dose pressures? I want to take it aside and go from this very pressing clinical problem to discuss, of course, the mitochondrion. So, uh, why, hopefully why I'm discussing this will become clear in a second. This is key to how metformin causes its issues. So you all know the mitochondria. You've got your outer membrane and your inner membrane, and then you've got your electron transport chain, 
which works by pumping hydrogens across this intermembrane space uh, it, it, to make a gradient where you've got more protons here than in, in the mitochondrial matrix. So you can use that proton gradient to make ATP. This is what you all you know, learned and loved during you know, uh, med school or grad school. You make ATP, this is how we're powered. You know, this is the vast majority of our ATP generation. How does metformin work? Well, there are studies that show that it binds to this electron transport chain and decouples it, similar to cyanide. But I'm more convinced by a paper that came out in Nature you know, around 2013 or 14. And this convincingly showed that metformin inhibits something called glycerophosphate dehydrogenase. There are energetic substances within the cytosol. There's NADH in the cytosol, and there's energetic substances, you know, NADH, FADH within the mitochondrion, but the two of them can't get across the mitochondrial membrane readily. So you've got this glycerophosphate shuttle as one of the mechanisms to get your cytosolic NADH into the mitochondrion. And if you inhibit, you know, one of the key enzymes involved in this process, what you end up with is metformin coming in, depleting your mitochondrion of, of FADH. So you have less electron transport chain activity, you make less ATP, and you're forced to get your ATPs through scrounging them through glycolysis, anaerobic respiration, which produces a large lactic acidosis. In other words, a lactic acidosis is the symptom of the poisoning. The real problem is lack of ATP. And while shock, you know, uh, while well, acidemia is not great, if your pH is less than seven, I'm willing to bet your cells aren't working well. I, I would also argue that the major problem with metformin is this lack of ATP and the mitochondria not doing its thing. And this is what ultimately leads to multi-organ failure. Metformin is dialyzable, but it's not that dialyzable. It's got a volume of distribution above one. So if you go with XTRIPS data, they suggest, yeah, you probably wanna consider extracorporeal removal if you have a lactate above 20, pH less than seven if your standard therapy fails. Maybe if you have a you know lactate above 15, consider, be more likely to consider it if you have patients that are even sicker. And they suggest hemo rather than CRT. So, so why is that? That's because and you know, metformin clearance is much better on hemo. If your kidneys work and you take it therapeutically, it is extensively secreted. Your half-life's four hours. You get rid of that stuff quickly. In overdose, you saturate those metabolism, you know, that, those mechanisms, and your kidneys don't work as well. The problem is that it's not metabolized. It is only renally excreted. So if your kidneys are toast, you can't get rid of it. Hemodialysis can get rid of uh, half of your metformin in roughly four hours. CRT can get rid of it in roughly 16 hours. So then the question becomes, can we safely do hemodialysis? And, and I just want to point out, well, we see hypotension in hemodialysis all the time, right? You know, 10% of treatments in outpatients. We see this all the time. Um, so I, I would argue that if the patient, if, you know, the, the risk of poisoning outcome exceeds the risk of increasing or adding vasopressors for your patient, turn up the pressors and consider intermittent hemodialysis. Don't remove hemo, you know, don't remove fluid on hemo. Pump, you know, give hemo, I, uh, give fluid on hemo. One of my favorite tricks is make the patient a leader positive at the end of your hemo for poisoning. Come back later with SLED or CRT and pull it off. Um, you know, do all the other tricks we do for hypotension. And then your patients who have profound cardiogenic shock, you know, you can, you know, there are ways to do hemo through ECMO. You need a, a cardiac surgeon who can give you a nice flow limiter and, and uh, you don't even need a catheter. Um, so how how this patient go? Well, after discussion, you know, I really want to you know give credit to this this uh, brave uh, pediatric nephrologist because they did four hours of hemo despite norepi of 1.5 mix mics per kg per minute plus high dose epi plus vaso, and uh, it, it was like magic. The patient got uh, the hemo six hours after lactate dropped. CRT was restarted. Hemo was performed once more about 12 hours later. And within 24 hours, they were off pressors and extubated. So this is a dramatic case. I'm a well aware that you can take one dramatic case and, and make your, you know, and try to make a point. Um, so use this extensive for toxicology case series of seven patients from Pittsburgh, where they took patients who were profoundly shocky with maps uh, generally below 60, sometimes below 40, 
at the initiation of hemodialysis and found that the MAP only went up as you removed the metformin for most patients. Um, and they had six out of seven of these patients who had lactates in the 20s and pH less than seven survived. You know, um, the uh, historical mortality is probably around 50%. And they were able to take one patient and do hemo for 20 hours despite four very high dose pressors. So it can be done. Um, it's not easy, but if the alternative is death for the patient, it's, it's probably worth considering. Uh, because I have seen a number of times where folks say, no, we, we can't do this, we do CRT, and, and things generally don't go well. Um, lastly, let me, let me end on a diagnostic note, maybe take 10 minutes or so to go through one of the, the greatest challenges I have in the poison center, and that is the call from a refer, typically from a referring uh, emergency physician to say, hey, look, we've already consulted the nephrology for this patient, but we've got someone who has a high anion gap, high osmol gap, they're obtunded and can't give us a history. We think this might be a toxic alcohol. Turns out 80% of those cases are not toxic alcohols. They're alcoholic ketoacidosis, or severe sepsis or something else, because the osmol gap is a non-specific test, at least at the levels we apply it at. If you look at alcohol ketoacidosis versus your toxic alcohol poisoning, you get an osmol gap and an anion gap, you get altered mentation. You don't always have positive ketones because if you're measuring acetone and as they've been drinking lots of ethanol, they have lots of NADH around to convert it to beta hydroxybutyrate, you might not see ketones even in these patients, despite their anion gap of 30 and their osmol gap of 30. And you say, my gosh, what could this be? Well, we know that the osmol gap correlates really well with methanol levels, um, where you can take your methanol concentration and your osmol gap, and it's almost a one-to-one. -one. And it correlates pretty well with ethylene glycol, where ethylene glycol actually increases the osmol gap more than the, the uh, ethylene glycol concentration, um, which is good if you're trying to say, um, you know, have it as an antifreeze, but bad if you're say trying to, to figure out if this is a, a poisoning or not. And then if you take all your patients who have an elevated osmol gap, which was defined as 15 or greater in this sample, you see, and this is from, uh, I believe, uh, University of Iowa's data, you've got a small number of toxic alcohols and you have many more alcoholic ketoacidosis, acute kidney injury where uremic toxins are causing things, diabetic ketoacidosis, other, et cetera. And if you look at the sensitivity, really the specificity of the, this test, you know, in, in uh, their data, you don't really seem to see it do a good job until you hit an osmol gap of 30 or 40. And other data back that up too, uh, including our own internal data uh, where this osmol gap of 20, which often raises alarm for possible toxic alcohol, you know, only having about, you know, maybe a 60% specificity at best for toxic alcohol. Um, there are other things which can cause this. And um, it's in, important to note that there are things like, uh, you know, amino acids or other things that are floating throughout critically ill patients that are you know, neutral, uh, these are, you know, since uh, your, your amino acids can be zwitter ions, you got one negative, one positive, they're functionally neutral and, and act as osmotic agents. So do many uremic toxins. Um, this is a challenge which we're working on. We actually have our own data that suggests you can't rely on the osmol gap alone. We are preparing this manuscript. Well, you know, probably more important than that, their own internal data, we want to validate this externally. Uh, but we've found that an osmol gap of around 30 to 35 to 40 gives you say an odds ratio of six to seven times for being a toxic alcohol, whereas one for below 20 is not very useful. And if you have a patient who has ethanol on board at all, well, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for this being methanol poisoning, because if I drank methanol and then I have a detectable ethanol level where ethanol is preferentially metabolized, what I would have had to done is drink methanol, wait for my anion gap acidosis to start, and follow it up with ethanol. And there are not a whole lot of people who are capable of doing that. So, and if you have a patient who comes in without a specific history of I drank, you know, a toxic alcohol, and their ethanol is positive, you know, we've got odds ratios, you know, less than 0.1 to suggest a toxic alcohol. In other words, this patient is, what, 20 times more likely, uh, you know, give or take, to not have toxic alcohol poisoning. 
So we don't block all these patients with omeprazole, and we certainly don't dialyze them empirically. So what's the problem? Why can't you just say, eh, just wait till their osmol gap reaches you know, 30, 35, otherwise we don't think about it? Because you can have, within, if, you're, if your normal osmol gap is say negative eight to six, and let's say you're on the negative five end, and you come in with an osmol gap of 15, that can represent an ethylene glycol concentration of 120 milligrams per deciliter, which is enough to give you substantial toxicity. So it's hard to discount the small osmol gap or even the lack of an osmol gap in the appropriate patient. Um, it's nice when the patient comes in and uh, from a diagnostic standpoint and has an osmol gap way above this and we can say, great, it's toxic alcohol. And you know what, unfortunately, there, there aren't a lot of patients like that. Um, so just a few take home points from this somewhat rambling talk. Again, know the principles of extracorporeal removal of, of the uremic toxins. They apply to xenobiotics as well. If you have a poisoning with severe organ dysfunction, consider hemodialysis over SLED or CRRT. Um, even with shock, um, for, for the aforementioned reasons, um, with some exceptions like lithium. If you want to know, well, what's my highest yield stuff? I never see this stuff. No toxic alcohol, salicylates, and lithium, and that will get you through the vast majority of practice as well as your boards. And, and lastly, you know, there, there are poison centers with toxicologists who know these poisonings. What they don't know is our therapies. And, you know, I, I am a firm believer that the best care is always, you know, uh, delivered with a direct toxicologist, nephrologist conversation. So please call the poison center and ask for the toxicologist on call and talk through. And most likely both of you will learn something and, and um, have a good time. So and with that, I would be happy to, um, uh, to take uh, any questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. King. That was wonderful. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand and we can uh, call upon you. Um, uh, to get the ball rolling, uh, you know, a few years ago, we switched from, uh, locally, we switched from CRRT to SLED. Uh, mm -hmm. So we are mostly a SLED center. Uh, and we, we do eight hour SLEDs with, um, you know, about QBEs of 200 and QDs of 300. Sure. Uh, at times, what we have done is if the patient is in the ICU, we, we uh, tell the ICU nurse to just ramp it up uh, and we get like an eight hour uh, dialysis uh, right. saying that it's a high efficiency sled, no longer a sled actually. Um, yeah. Are there any thoughts about, uh, I know the data, there is little data on sled in particular. Is there anything in particular that you would say on kinetics that we should be worried about or thinking about with sled? With lithium, like it's an eight hour sled just as good as CRRT? Potentially, I mean, I would imagine it's it's better during that that time frame because you know the Q, as you know well, QB of two hundred, QD of uh, three hundred, you're you're getting better clearance and you're twenty five mils per per gig per hour. So, I would imagine it's better. Um, lithium is a real ball of wax. That the problem with lithium, again, patients are unlikely to die. There are patients who are uh, who may develop what's called silent, the syndrome of irreversible lithium effectuated neurotoxicity, which is a great acronym and, and kind of describes the issue where patients may develop neurocognitive changes or even persistent delirium that doesn't clear after lithium poisoning. And if you look in the data, most patients who develop that don't have very high lithium levels. In fact, they're probably lithium levels that are closer to two, you know, in the twos rather than in the fives or sixes. Um, and uh, they're almost invariably patients who are older. So no, I, I think that's, I, I honestly think that's great. I also think, you know, logistically, it sounds like you'd have an easier time than I do. I have, a, I have to fight for hemodialysis longer than three hours on, you know, 140 kilo uh, ICU patients. Yeah, yeah. With, with hemo, what we often are able to do is to just carry on. And, and as long as we have nursing, which right now is, of course, hard, uh, but sure. as long as yes, we have nursing, we can, uh, we can push the machine to almost up to eight hours, I think. After that, we have to crash and, of course, uh, restart if we need to. Um, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, yeah, Yolanda. <clears throat> so this might be less a question for Dr. King and more for my colleagues. And it's been a long time since I've been involved in an alcohol poisoning. But last time, which might tell you how long ago it was, it was not easy for us to get from Epizole. 
Uh, so I'm just curious how, whether that's available to us here in Ottawa and, and maybe um, Josh, you could tell us how widespread, it, how available it is uh, in general. Varies by country. Um, there have been periodic drug shortages and our plan for that has been ethanol. The U.S. largely does not have IV ethanol. I don't know if that's available to you. If it is not, you know, enteral ethanol does a good uh, does a good job. Um, uh, you know, Darren Roberts, who I mentioned earlier, you know, the the you know, the, the smarter, more experienced nephrologist toxicologist, the last e last extra meeting talked about regularly using alcohol drips and how hard they are because you're basically keeping somebody drunk. You're keeping their ethanol level around 150. Um, you don't want to drop below 100 uh, you know, milligrams per deciliter. So they're, you know, point one, they are, well, they're combative. Um, so uh, I think that in the in the lack of that, when we've had that too, I would go ahead and give it PO. I, I don't know Canadian availability. I do know it varies widely between countries and that, you know, we, we have periodic shortages as well. Yeah, um, I, I Manish put in the chat that it was available in Manitoba. I've seen it in, in Quebec as well, and I think it is available here. Maybe is that what you are wanting to talk about? If you have another question, Todd. I, I had a different question. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but Renu just replied in the chat that she has had no trouble getting it. So I, I, I'm pretty sure it is available uh, again. Like you said, we don't have many cases. Uh, so, uh, you know, the experience, yeah, and Adriana has used it here. So I guess it is available here in Ottawa. Um, go ahead, Todd. Uh, that was awesome. That was a great talk. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about the metformin toxicity and when to dialyze. Um, we do see a fair number of patients in the intensive care unit that have shock, um, are on pressors, um, are also on metformin and have a mild lactic acidosis. So I haven't, I have to admit, I haven't seen people with lactates over 20 or 30, but we're often asked to come in and dialyze and their lactates are eight or 10, but they do have shock maybe. Um, uh, and the question is, is that an indication that we should be really pushing for a hemodialysis session or if they've got accompanying AKI, are we okay going with SLED or a CRT modality? That's a great question. Um, and and I would imagine in that case that I think as you're alluding to, you know, metformin-induced lactic acidosis, whether you call it mala, metformin-induced or, or metformin poisoning, the lactate is a symptom of mitochondrial dysfunction. So if you have a patient with shock and a lactate of eight, then that probably doesn't ref primarily reflect metformin. That probably reflects the underlying sepsis. Now, is the metformin on board maybe making it harder for them to deal with the, the metabolic stress? Yeah, maybe. In in my mind, would that push you to dialyze with hemo? No. I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I get really, I, I, you know, I, I talk in a good game about, hey, Put them on you know, hemo through pressors. I still get very nervous, um, and and I I don't think you can justify variance from normal practice if you don't think it's primarily metformin. And I, I think and and I will say there have been a few cases where someone's on metformin and they have a lactate of twenty. And the thought is, oh my gosh, this is metformin toxicity. Do hemodialysis, and then you find out after the fact. Well, no, it was mesenteric ischemia, uh, and they had a big clot. Uh, no, so. It's not always metformin either. Thank you. Uh, I think Peter also had a question. Uh, yeah, to go back to the um, alcohol issue. Um, yes, we used to, people in the comments have been talking about IV uh, ethanol and ethanol and dialysis and used to do that quite commonly. Uh, it was a slight pain in the ass, but quite doable, and that was before for methazol. Um, it was really quite hard in our hospital to obtain oral alcohol. There's a bias against it, uh, but there were certainly things published about basically keeping people drunk. Uh, four or five ounces of vodka to start, and a couple of ounces every hour or something like that. Because uh, you're right, it's twice the legal limit that you're aiming for, uh, which can be an issue. Um, I wanted to bring up your 
slightly complicated formula for calculating how long you have to dialyze somebody. Sure. And I must admit, I always did just the sort of simple basing it on urea, because as you pointed out, the clearance is pretty close to urea. Yeah. And everybody's pretty familiar with the four hour dialysis at full blood flow, et cetera, lowering your urea by 65 or 66 percent URR. And therefore, you can assume that four hours into a dialysis, your ethanol levels down by, okay, not quite 65%, but something like that. And you can do some pretty simple arithmetic, which gets you to the same 10 or 12 hours that mm -hmm. you used. And I've always done that, telling the nurses, okay, it looks like we're going to have to dialyze for about 12 hours, but let's do a level after eight hours and see where we're at. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, I, and I think you could you can do that. Um, the the reason I went with this method and let's see if I can't. Uh, pull up the, the PDF just to share. The, the only reason I went with this method is because it was um, validated, although it's basically that same clearance times 0.8. Um, that is literally all it is saying yeah, it might take a small uh it might take slightly more time um and uh not sure why it's uh not coming up but um i'll pull it up here so um yeah I, I think that and i'll just share my screen so hopefully you can see this 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 is one of the the papers that that you know validated the method you know, had the patients but they basically use the same formula and they used um, you know 80% of ureas you know manufacturers right and they predict they went through predicted time versus required time and again this is toxicology what does that mean well e even when nephrologists do toxicology research they don't have a huge number of patients so your your mileage may vary but it was pretty close um, you know I'll say beyond that you don't have to do a 12-hour dialysis if you don't if you don't have the capability of doing that. As long as you remove the toxic metabolite, there's nothing wrong with saying, let's normalize the anion gap, keep them on all overnight, come back, remove it the next day. The only reason you wouldn't is because of cost. Fomepazole is about $1,000 per gram. Uh, you're giving roughly that amount you know, every 12 hours, and you're actually giving more of it if you're dialyzing it because it is dialyzable. Um, then you know so that that's a consideration um but other but, and the whole reason to dialyze them long enough is so you can say all right we can stop the pump all we're done but you know you could just dialyze them and say you know this this is a massive overdose i'm going to remove the stuff that's going to cause further organ issue you know toxicity and come back the next day and and finish the the job there's nothing wrong with that in my mind yeah that that does make sense um and I think we are running uh, uh, close to the end of time. Uh, if there are no other questions, I, I would like to again thank uh, Dr. King, Josh, for uh, presenting this wonderful educational session on toxins. Uh, if any one of you are on Twitter, make sure to follow him at uh, NephroTox uh, for more of these toxicology polls uh, and discussions. Um, thanks again. Thank you, Swapna, for inviting me. Thank you so much, everyone, for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you.